here. We thank and we praise you for this is Sabbath day, another opportunity to gather as your people, a day of rest from our busy week, set aside for worshiping you, set aside as a time for fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us to watch for you in our lives in the ways that you are already providing for our needs. Help us to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit within us, the very power of God that shapes and molds us in ways seen and unseen. Holy Spirit, open our minds, illumine us, with your good word this day and make us sensitive to your presence here in, through, and among us. We pray all these things through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you join with me in the call to worship taken from Psalm 22 that is printed in your bulletins. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. I invite you to pull your hymnals from the pew racks and turn to hymn number 23, All Creatures of Our God and King. Follow along with the words, and uh, we pray that very soon we will be singing uh, the words of our hymns once again. Uh, until that time, you are always invited to ponder on them as David plays the tune on our behalf. Hymn number 23.
last uh, words of the last verse. Let all things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. It's what we do on Sunday mornings. I don't know that there's any other place that I would truly want to be than gathered in worship on Sunday morning. Sunday is the Sabbath day, that gift given to us to realign ourselves with God. It's also why we come before the Lord ready to confess our sinfulness out of our humbleness, our submission, our worshipfulness of Almighty God. We are truly privileged to be able to come before God uh, confessing our sins and the sinfulness of the world in which we live. It is a gift. So I, I ask that you would join me again this Sunday morning. Uh, let's pray the prayer of confession together that's printed in your bulletins. Lord God of new beginnings, in rising from the grave, you conquered sin and death. We celebrate that even the power of death cannot contain you. You are the author of life both here and now, and in the eternal life to come. However, we so often continue to choose the way of death and separation from God. We live for ourselves rather than living for you. We confess our continual need for your unmerited grace. Loving God, grant us new life again this day as we come to you in humble confession of our sins, in order that we would take the message of your love and mercy with us into the world.
and uh, our daughter-in-law also I'm going to uh, keep her pregnancy. Uh, they lost a child, um, I think, uh, six weeks old um, last March. And so this next pregnancy is filled with joy and trepidation. So uh, we'll keep Daniela and the baby and Travis in our prayers. Yes, I saw Timmy. And, and that decision, did you say, is next week? Jesus, fill us with the courage to speak your name with boldness and to tell the gospel story to the world, a story that heals our wounds, frees our souls, promises eternal life, and fills our hearts with joy. May we tell of it in ways that reflect the gift we've been given and the grateful hearts with which it is received. Lord, we pray this day for the world in which we live. We 
pray for leaders across the globe as well as those right here in our own communities. Lord, soften hearts and minds that each one would be inspired to seek the good over the desire for power and control. Lord, we pray for our country. Show us the way forward. Heal our divisions so that we might live peaceful lives, striving always toward your kingdom's goals. Teach us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We pray to stay grateful for all of our many blessings. And yet we also do so mindful of those with less and those with none. Help us to be generous in sharing what we have with others, trusting always in your good provision. Lord, make us, as your church here in Ridgefield, into a place where all are welcome, a place of hope and of love, a diverse body of believers who celebrate our unique qualities and invite others to join us in the journey. We praise you this day. We thank you for showing us what selfless love looks like, for coming into our world in order to open our eyes to God's immense extravagant love for us. We praise you for seeking us out when we ourselves were lost. We thank you and we praise you for birthdays, for Barb who turns 82 on Thursday and Jonah who turns 12 tomorrow. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the next year of life that it would be filled with joy and opportunities to live and grow. Lord, we thank you for anniversaries, for those you give us to walk this life and this road with here in this church for the six years of ministering together, always pointing to you and not to ourselves, Lord, I thank and I praise you for the love of a good husband and marriage that you have ordained for us. Lord, we lift up all of those who are suffering this day from whatever it is their suffering may be called. We pray for Justin as he faces a decision about his future and for his addiction to alcohol, Lord. We ask that you would move in his life in powerful ways and that you would heal him. Lord, we pray for Daniela and the baby that she carries, as well as for Travis as they await the birth of their second child. Lord, we pray that it will be a healthy child that will grow to live into a long life and bless her parents. pray for Tony Ann. Faced with important decisions, we ask for clarity, and wisdom, and support in whatever it is she decides that it would be the right path. We pray for all of those who are suffering from COVID this day, all those who are grieving losses, whatever they may be called, And we pray together with one voice the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Philip, however, 
appeared at the Zobis and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jen. So Jen just read for us the scripture about Philip. Philip is one of seven deacons that was chosen by the Christian community in Jerusalem. He was affirmed by the apostles when the persecution of Christians began. But you need to hear what led up to that persecution to fully understand what's going on here. You see, the apostle Stephen had just become the first of what would be many Christian martyrs. Stephen had been testifying of the risen Christ throughout Jerusalem, and he was then brought up on charges of blasphemy. Stephen testified before the Sanhedrin council and angered them so much in his testimony about Jesus that he was instantly dragged out of the city gates and he was stoned just outside of Jerusalem. We are told also that Saul, who will later become the Apostle Paul, was there and he gave his approval to the killing of Stephen. And it was on that very day that a great persecution broke out against all of the believers in Jerusalem. Now remember back also that in a very short amount of time from Pentecost until this account we read today, no less than 8,000 men, so we must assume that there were also women and children, came to believe in Jesus Christ. The church was growing in Jerusalem by leaps and by bounds thanks to the Holy Spirit's power at work in and through and among the disciples. But now many of those who had come to faith there in the city of Jerusalem fled. It was a dangerous place to be as a believer, and so they fled the city of Jerusalem and they moved on, many of them back to the places where they had originally come from, and they took their faith with them wherever it was they were dispersed to. This is yet greater evidence we have, once again, that God's kingdom goals cannot be thwarted. And God can even use our adversity for God's own benefit. And so the message continues to spread, and now it's taken to many new places as well. Philip is one of those who was in Jerusalem when the persecution began. And so Philip fled, heading off to Samaria. And so there is Philip in Samaria in a city in the midst of what is described as a very successful mission spreading the good news. When suddenly an angel of the Lord, this is a messenger of some shape or form, we're not told exactly what, but it's a messenger with a message from Jesus. And it suddenly interrupts this ministry, the successful ministry he has happening in a city in Samaria, and it gives him an order to leave Samaria immediately and head off now for a lonely, isolated desert road that runs through the wilderness between Jerusalem and Gaza. Now I will confess to you that if I had been Philip, if this had been my successful ministry there in Samaria and I saw my church growing rapidly and successfully, I probably would have had some pushback for that messenger of the Lord. What do you mean leave? Now? My ministry here is going so well and there's still work to be done. By all human reasoning, Philip certainly has no reason whatsoever to think of moving on at this point in time. 
There in Samaria, the church is growing, people are being healed, miracles are being performed, the power of the Holy Spirit is clearly at work. But this is what happens sometimes with God. Sometimes things get cut short and God sends us off in a whole new direction. And yet even with the help of the Holy Spirit within us, we still sometimes question what God is doing. God's mission and God's purposes don't always look like the ones we have in mind. We think we know what success is, and then God suddenly comes along and says, you're going to do something different. And yet we think all the while we know what's best when God has a holy different idea for us. So it's then that we must trust the Holy Spirit within us to simply know when to listen and to obey. Even when God's plan sounds like a bad idea to our ears. I think always of the Virgin Mary in such times as this, being told that she was going to become the mother of God's only son. An unwed virgin teenager who was engaged to be married, living at a time when such a scandal as this could easily get you killed. And yet Mary responds to the messenger of the Lord with rejoicing. And I remember also Joseph, these two common people who were not all that dissimilar from you and I, who was also told not to dismiss her from his engagement to her, but to marry her anyway. And Joseph willingly and wholeheartedly becomes an earthly father to Jesus. Certainly neither one of them could have understood God's plan completely. When the messenger arrived, they just simply obeyed. They trusted God to do whatever needed to be done. God's plans are not always the plans that we ourselves might prefer, and they certainly do not always come easy to us. They're not necessarily comfortable they don't always have every detail worked out, nor do they always make sense to us from our limited human perspective. I know this from my own experience, and I'm sure many of you do as well, because if anyone had told me years ago that six years later I would be standing here in the pulpit this morning working for a 253-year-old Reformed congregation living in the busiest part of New Jersey while also earning a master's degree, I would have told you you were crazy. Yet I, like Philip, have merely ventured into unknown territory while continuing to testify to the power of Christ's resurrection at work and the Holy Spirit's power to guide our steps. It's the Holy Spirit of God that moves us. It's the Holy Spirit that prompts us to go to new places and meet new people, those we would otherwise never have met. I never would have known all of you. God sends us to places we ourselves have never been before, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to the people and in the ways that God dictates for us to do so. All the while, our role is to simply trust in God. So Philip, filled with the Holy Spirit, trusts God enough and he leaves his successful ministry in Samaria, and he heads off for the wilderness, just as the messenger of the Lord told him to do, without so much as any idea of why, or what, or who he might encounter. So there on this desolate, lonely road between Jerusalem and Gaza, Philip meets a stranger in a chariot reading aloud from the book of Isaiah. And this man is on his way home from worshiping in Jerusalem. 
The man is described as an Ethiopian eunuch. I think we often hear that and don't really think all that much about it. This is one of those fairly familiar stories to us. The word eunuch in the Greek is eunuchos. This is an, an important official who's in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. Queen of the Ethiopians. Now in our contemporary understanding, the use of the word eunuch simply means a castrated man, but it had a broader definition in ancient times. <clears throat> In the original Greek, biblical eunuchs stood for all sexual minorities. Literally, the word means keepers of the bed. Eunuchs served and guarded women in royal palaces and wealthy households, hence queen of the Ethiopians. Now, the reason for the use of eunuchs in certain positions was that their employers wanted to be certain that the eunuchs wouldn't get sexually involved with the women that they were supposed to serve and protect. So many, if not all of them, were both castrated and homosexual. Eunuchs were trusted officials who often rose to senior posts in the government, and they were viewed as highly trustworthy individuals. Eunuch is an ancient term for what we today might call the LGBTQ community. And Jesus himself referred to eunuchs, declaring in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, that there are eunuchs who are born that way. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. In other words, they've been castrated and therefore they are asexual. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the dominion of heaven, also known as persons who are purposely celibate. In any case, and for whatever reason, we know from the scriptures that this man is an Ethiopian, he is a foreigner, who is also outside the social norms of typical or acceptable Judaic first century sexuality. There is another controversy as well that concerns whether the Ethiopian eunuch was a Jew or a Gentile. Now church tradition speculates that this was the first Gentile convert to Christianity because this man was an Ethiopian and not a Jew. But there is actually significant evidence that this man was a Jewish convert, hence he is on his way home from worshiping in Jerusalem and reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. But either way, when Philip sees the eunuch on the road to Gaza, the Holy Spirit then urges Philip to run up and speak to the man. And soon the two men are absorbed in a deep conversation about the scripture that the eunuch is reading. That scripture is Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. This, my friends, is significant. Because this particular passage describes the humiliation and the injustice experienced by God's own suffering servant. And we have to wonder, based on all of what we know about this, if perhaps the eunuch settled upon these two verses of scripture because of the rejection that he himself has just faced by the religious leaders having just come from the temple in Jerusalem. This is a man who is highly respected and honored and trusted in Ethiopian society, and yet he's shunned in Jerusalem because eunuchs are viewed as sexual outcasts by first century Jewish religious tradition. And Jewish law also expressly forbids the conversion of eunuchs to Judaism, saying in Deuteronomy 23.1 that no one whose male parts were crushed or cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of God. And yet here we are, my friends, out in the middle of nowhere. 
and with a complete and utter stranger, a foreigner, an outcast, a person who Philip himself has been taught to shun by his own religious upbringing, and yet we find Philip filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip, God's servant, Philip, disciple of Christ, using the Jewish prophecy, prophecy about God's own rejected servant, Jesus, to spread the good news of the risen Savior as these two men travel along in the chariot. Philip doesn't stop to question God's intention. He doesn't debate the man's worthiness of God's salvation. He does simply what the Spirit directs him to do. And he proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. And that which from all human perspectives looks like just a chance encounter out there in the wilderness with a stranger ends up bearing fruit, tremendous fruit, in fact, for God's kingdom. You see, the eunuch hears the message and is stirred and moved by it, and he winds up asking that very same question that many are still asking in the church of Jesus Christ today. What should stop this man from being baptized? Philip simply replies in the affirmative. And he baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch right there and right then. And God's mission has been accomplished. Immediately then, the Holy Spirit sends Philip off in another direction, into the next place that God is calling him to go. And we're told that the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. The second century church father, Iranius, writes about the Ethiopian eunuch saying that he went back to Ethiopia and he began now to proclaim the message of the good news of salvation. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, he is known as Simeon the Black. He's also mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 as being a foundational prophet and teacher at the church in Antioch. The point of this story, my friends, about the Ethiopian eunuch is this. We are not called to judge that which God himself ordains, nor are we to deny the Holy Spirit's mysterious work in the world, which according to John 3, 8, blows wherever it pleases. We may hear its sound, but we cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, and so it is with the work of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, our willingness to obey, we then become instruments of God's redeeming work in the world carrying out the unpredictable wind of God's Spirit as it moves in, among, and through us, and in, and among, and through Christ's church. This is the very power that empowers us to look past our own limiting ideas, our own need for control, our own prejudice and plans in order to accept Christ's own plan for our lives and for his church. Plans that bear fruit of the vine as Jesus continues to abide in us and through us and among us. The Lord, my friends, is waiting once again to feed our souls and enrich our spirits for the journey that lay ahead for each one of us this morning. So I invite you, let's join him now at his table of grace.
and in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to obtain for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as a true heavenly bread that strengthens us to life eternal. And the cup of blessing he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if, if we too are to bear fruit. We come in hope that this supper is but a pledge and a foretaste, this bread and this cup of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him made like unto him in his glory. Since by Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, he has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all into one body, so are we to receive the supper in true brotherly and sisterly love, mindful of the communion of saints. This table does not belong to us at all, but to God. All those who profess a love of the Lord Jesus are welcome to partake. Come, for all things are now ready. Would you join with me in the prayer printed in your communion inserts? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created the heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 holy God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. 
And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion with the body of Christ. Even to our enemies. 